So when I was getting my degree, and I had physics professor, very famous guy. His name was, was Habermesh. He was a Russian Jew. He translated, I don't know how many of your physicists here, but he translated Londa and Lipschitz's book into English. Londa and Lipschitz were great Russian scientists, and he translated it into English. And uh, so he was teaching solid state, solid state physics, right? So one day I went to his office and they say, Professor Hammermesh, I don't, I don't understand today's lecture at all. He said, don't worry about it. Is it on? Is it, can you hear? Yes, yes, yes. So he said, don't worry about it. I said, what if you ask this in the exam? He said, don't worry about it, don't answer. I said, uh, I may not get a good grade, you know, good marks in this country, that's what we say, a good grade. He said, you don't have to understand everything in life. That is very accurate, very accurate. So why, why did I say that? If you don't know how to put this up straight, it's OK. I'm with you. I don't know how to do that. So don't, don't. Uh... And also when I joined the Air Force, uh, I was telling our colleagues here, to the two Air Force guys there, Chaudhary and uh, Rahul, and I was talking to them. So when I joined the Air Force, I, I, I always used to wonder, how is the Air Force working? Nobody seems to be working, but the airplanes are flying, you know? And my chief scientist told me, don't worry about finding out how the Air Force works. You'll never find out. It works. It is so true, right? Don't you agree? They are not. Quite, they don't agree with me. You, they, you don't want to say it because you're sitting in India and talking about Indian Air Force. Say these people complain. No, but that's true. Though a lot of times we don't know. You know how things work in complicated organizations. You know, you guys are Bharat Forge, very complicated organization, right? Very complicated. You just don't have the, you just don't know how it works, you know. Amit, can you set this up? Yeah. Um, you just don't know how things work. They just work, that's it. Um, <clears throat> so there are a few good lessons I learned very early on that I don't have to understand everything. I don't have to know everything. There's no need to. Just know a few things that you love, that you passionately, that you passionately like. There should be a passion. So work should not be work. What should be love? You love to work. Get up in the morning and go to work. I always used to be the first guy to go to work, first guy to show up with the work, always, at office, you know. But I was not the last guy to leave. Maybe, yeah. So, you know, what I would like to do today is actually, I have this one hour, right? Or one hour and a half hours. And then we have some time tomorrow also. Dr. Pali, Palkiwala, no, Paliwal, Dr. Paliwal is giving a lecture also tomorrow. And his lecture is going to be very interesting also. He's going to demonstrate on the computer. His student is here. There he is, you know. And he's going to, it's a very interesting thing what he does. So try to take advantage tomorrow when he comes. And uh, you guys know, uh, I forgot your name already. Yeah. Do you know his name? I mean, do you know him? Dr. Paliwal's, Professor Paliwal's student. He's kind of shy, look, you know, guy, little young fellow. He look, kind of looks like he's in high school. <laughs> behind the computer, hiding behind the computer. So, huh? What? Early Edison. Yeah. <laughs> so, now when I came, when I thought you were sitting in this, in this room, I said, why are you sitting in this class? You look like you're in high school. Should go back. You know, that's what I thought. He was look so young to me. You know, of course, some of you do look young, and he looks really young, and uh, which is I don't I'm, I don't mean in a bad way. I mean, in a, yeah, you know. Hey, I'm not the, I'm not that old. Okay, don't. <laughs> you know, one thing uh, one thing somebody told me is when somebody tells your age, especially Indian guys when they tell their age, add five more years to it. <laughs> No, I'm, uh, I'm not that old, actually. Well, <laughs> um, actually, I come to work. I work more than most young people at work. That's true. I think the more you work, the more young, younger you look. That's, a, that's truth. As long as you're not worrying about life. The other day, somebody was worrying about life. What am I going to do five years from? I'm not going to point out. I know it was you. I didn't want to tell everybody, <laughs> unless you want me to. <laughs> this guy is so worried, what am I going to do five years from now? 
then somebody else was with me. Was it Shinde or somebody was else was with me? <laughs> or you were, yeah, you were with, with us. And I said, how many things have happened exactly what you were thinking five years ago? How many? Nothing. Zero. Maybe in a broader sense, you think that something is going to happen, right? But if you say, I'm going to marry that beautiful looking girl from uh, Andhra Pradesh or Orissa or someplace like that, you know, you probably will not, that may not happen. It may be completely different, you know. <laughs> you, I, I don't mean to scare you, you know. <laughs> you, you just don't know what is going to happen in life, you know. Just do your best today. What you want to do today, just do today what is the best thing to do. So you make a note on your office or at home, I want today to be the best person I can be. So every day you see, today is the day. So you can be the good, best husband, best father, best teacher, best student, best whatever you want to do. Just, just today. And we'll worry about tomorrow when it comes. You know. So when I was coming here, I don't mean, you know, I'm talking about psychology. <laughs> Professor of psychology. Oh, when I was leaving America to come here, I started to wonder, you know, how, how is my class going to go? How many, what will be the students? And my friend said, he said, Kumar, don't worry about that. Just tell God that, that we're going to India and tell God, can you be there before me to take care of everything? <laughs> That's true. You know, I don't mean to be, uh, you know, religion, I don't mean to bring religion and spirituality into this room. You know, but God is like that, right? You know, it doesn't matter whether you're a Hindu God or a Christian God or whatever, you know, Muslim God or Jewish God. It doesn't matter, or Jesus Christ, whatever. But God is like our Father. He will do anything for you, or she will do anything for you, he or she. That's the good thing about Indians. We have she, God, he, God. We can pick anybody we want to. We've got a thousand gods, you know. We can pick one you like. And not many people have that luxury. <laughs> no, they don't. They have to go after what Jesus Christ said. A lot of my friends, Christians, say, you have to follow Jesus. I don't have to follow Jesus. I can pick anybody I want. I can pick Jesus, too, because he spent a lot of time with Krishna in India. <laughs> No, my friend has a picture. My friend has a picture. My friend, Craig and Kimberly, you know, they're girlfriend, boyfriend. They're like in the late 40s. They know more about Hinduism than I do. They are going to come for Kumbh Mela next year. They already booked their tickets for next year. They're allowed to come. I said, Kumbh Mela, do you know how many people are there? Come on, I love Indians. I should have been born in India. I've been born in the wrong, wrong part of the world. And in his office, he's got a picture of Jesus and Krishna flowing in this, walking in the sky together. <laughs> yeah, really. I thought that was very neat. When Jesus was missing for five years in his life, he spent time in India, actually. He was missing for five years in his life. He only lived up to 38 or something. He died 38. The Romans killed him, right? The Romans put him on the cross and nailed him. That's what the punishment used to be. And that's the punishment he got. So everybody says, oh, Jesus died for us, you know. But anyways, I'm not a religious preacher. Um, <coughs> I'm a Hindu, by the way. <laughs> huh? That's it. That's right. That's right. absolutely correct. I hate it when I'm an American. Somebody says, which state are you from? Give me a break. I'm 10,000 miles away from my home country where I was born. It doesn't matter whether I'm a Gujarati or Telugu or Tamil or Kalia, Malayalam, whatever. How, could it, how does it matter? The bottom line is I was born in India and I was brought up here. So I changed into Indian in five minutes after I landed in this country. Five minutes, man. I become completely Indian, you know. Totally. My, all, everything comes out. My Hindi is better. My Telugu is better. Tamil, everything comes out. Okay, let's get back to this before Ramesh says what's going on here. You can put on now. We'll talk more about materials. So, yeah. Um, let's start with this and then we'll add yours also. Huh? Let's, let's start. Let's get it started first. Otherwise, we'll lose time. So, let's start with the NDT, NDE. <clears throat> um, so, let's see. My experience... Um, I don't remember everything. It's been about. Um, so we did some experiments. Uh, when I say we, 
Trivikram Kundu, Kundu, myself, and Das. Yeah. Okay. Kundu at all, you know. He's a professor at the University of Arizona. So one of the things we did was to, we took a plate and we put thermal protection. Small, you know, small squares. So we took an aluminum plate, aluminum plate, and then we glued thermal protection tiles. Small ones. I believe it was like inch and a half by inch and a half squares. There was a reason why we put so many. Okay. And then we, uh, yeah, this, so the purpose was to, we use ping pong ball. We don't use a big you know, heavyweight things, so we'll shatter the whole thing, okay? We used a ping pong ball so that we will drop it from a, very precisely, we had a tube, so that every time we drop it from the ping pong ball, it just goes exactly and hits one of these tiles, okay? So that will be like an impact. So this was, we were simulating like a, sorry, like a uh, spacecraft up there in the sky, right? Spacecraft up in the space. So you have a thermal protection system, and you have the aluminum, right? And the glue that we used was a special glue that's normally used by the NASA guys also, you know, the thermal protection that can withstand high temperatures and all that, right? So the idea was to, uh, if it hit here, if, anywhere, if it hit here, for instance, how do you know, the goal was to find out which tile it hit, the location of the tile. So even though I know this, but we will pretend that we don't know. So we know the dimensions of this, right? We know the dimensions of this, so we would like to find out the location of the impact. This is a paper that I can, uh, my computer is here, so I can look, send it out. Location of the impact, so this answers your thermal protection question also, Jalaj. Um, and, uh, So we were using uh, the, okay, so there are two possibilities, right? There are two possibilities. One is isotropy, which means that the um, velocity in every direction is the same. The sound velocity is every direction is the same. Because you're hitting an impact, you're making an impact on this, okay? And it'll make, obviously, it's a ultra, it'll make a sound, and the sound will go through this aluminum plate. So the idea was one will be isotro isotropy, so the sound velocity in every direction, so maybe this direction, that direction, this direction, is all same, velocity of sound is same. But if you take an anisotropic plate, then the velocities are different, okay? I only work with smart guys. This guy is so smart, Bikram Kundu, very smart guy, Trivikram. Okay, smart guy, mechanics. Uh, anisotropy. So all the, velo the velocities in all the directions are different, right? So the, so the technique that we normally use to detect where the location was is a triangulation technique. You take the velocities and you, you know, tell exactly where it is, triangulation technique. Triangulation technique to determine the location, okay? To determine the location. So, what we then said is that, let us take NS, the case of anisotropy, where um, the velocities are not the same, and the triangulation technique will not be applicable. How do you then determine location? So those are all solving the equations, essentially, you know. Uh, how do you develop an algorithm, or how do you develop a 
or dollop a algorithm, dollop an algorithm for for location when you're dealing with <clears throat> anisotropic solids. And that's a very important question, right? You know, half of the battle is defining the problem and understanding what the problem is. That's half of the battle. The other half is the solution, which is the easier part. But understanding the real problem is very difficult. You know what Einstein said once time? We talked about God and all that. So Einstein once said that, if I knew God's mind, I can provide the solution. So I can do the, I can solve problems, but he has to give me the problem. The re, so I have to understand the problem exactly, and it has to come from there. You know, my, my brain is not enough to comprehend the problem. A guy like Einstein saying that I don't know what to do about myself. <laughs> okay. And this is a very, very interesting question because here I said that uh, the tiles, we are putting an aluminum plate. Aluminum is isotropic. Most of the metals are, except for aluminum lithium, which is not. Except for aluminum lithium, which is not, okay? That's not me, right? I don't, that's not, okay. Uh, but, but, but in the future, as we are going for composites, this plate could be a composite instead of aluminum, right? And it could be one of those weaved composites, right? So weaved composites are like, uh, you know, so we have layers, right? So there we can have one of these layers, like this orthogonal layers. Okay, I'm not putting everything. And then we can have 45 degree layers. Really complex, right? One, two, three layers like that. And each time, if, you, if, there's a villa, if, if there's a sound uh, sound coming from our, whatever sound is, it's coming, and if it hits this, I mean, you got so many options there, and the velocities are completely different. V vertical, maybe, V horizontal. And V 45 degrees. <clears throat> So essentially, that was, the, that was the problem that was solved, and I got a paper on that. It will take me all, the whole day, essentially, to explain this further than this, okay? I just wanted to, to, to define the problem, what it is. And when we published that paper, everybody got excited, and the, the, the news clip came out. Oh, they have found a solution to solve NASA's problem. You know, we were not trying to do that at all. Actually, it was totally wrong. We're just trying to do a laboratory experiment, putting some thermal protection tiles on top of an aluminum plate and then a composite plate to see if we can locate the, accurately locate. Because when we were dropping the, when we were dropping the ping pong ball, we can drop exactly at any of these. So we know the coordinates exactly, what the coordinate is. We know experimentally what the coordinate is. Will the computation algorithm predict that particular point. So you get the validation and also, especially if this is a composite plate, you know. This is a composite anyways. This, these tiles are also a little bit, you know, different. So that was, that's what comes to my mind at this point right now, okay? The solution is there. I can give you the paper. I brought them with me. And uh, Yesterday I was, I think I mentioned about guided waves. You know, when you have pipelines carrying, you know, oil or gas or anything like that for miles and miles long, if you hit the, the hit, so you want the sound to transfer, go all the way, right? It will transfer long ways. And if you can do that without attenuation, because if I hit the sound, you know, we know that the attenuation is usually like this, right? Exponentially it goes down any form of wave. Um, the idea was, so if I, this is just like light actually, in a way this is like optics. So I'm gonna take a medium, like let us say water, for instance, some medium, second medium. Oh, by the way, uh, sound, uh, ultrasonics cannot travel in air too well. They cannot. They will just die, literally. So if I have an ultrasonic transducer, 
if this is my ultrasonic transducer, if this is air, obviously this is air, you will lose most of the energy, most of the acoustic energy you will lose. So this is like an acoustic transducer. Okay? So what they do normally is <clears throat> they will glue it down. They will they'll put some kind of an interface here. On this interface usually is a, is a uh, the closest thing that comes is like a wax, some kind of a wax. Grease, wax, yeah. Honey, whatever, you know, some interface so that that air is displaced completely with this, you know, with this. Uh, what, sir? Yeah. Yeah, it, it loses the energy, right? So usually you'll put something here so that the transfer is good. Like, I'm, st I'm still not able to understand bat. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying, bird, yeah, bat. Oh, you're talking about the bat that emits the ultrasounds and it comes back. Yeah, 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 I see. When I said bat, I'm trying to think what kind of glue is that? I was thinking because I was talking about this. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So bat is using ultrasound? Yes, absolutely. And then the, the, the signal comes back. It's got both the transducer and the receiver. Yes. It's got both in one, in one body, in one brain or whatever that thing has. You know, it can send and receive, and it can calculate the distance exactly. Smarter than me and you combined. Huh? Yeah, most animals can. When the tsunami took place about, what, 10 years ago? 15 years ago? Huh? Yeah, 14 years ago. My goodness. Okay, time goes by. 14 years ago, the, all the animals in the, near the Indian Andabar, Nicobar, Andaman, Nicobar Islands, they all came to know that something is happening. They all left. How bad can the sound Well, how come you're hearing 20,000 kilohertz? 20,000 hertz. Your, your range is 20 to 20, you're, you told me yesterday. 20 to 20,000, right? Which is correct, which is correct. Dogs can hear sounds that you and I can't, cannot hear, right? When they do dog training, they have a whistle. It blows, but you can't hear the sound, but dogs can hear. They got a different range where they can also hear. They're more gifted than, than us in that, in that range, you know. So bats, so bats, like we were talking about yesterday, they will send the ultras. So here is, uh, here is my tree, right? <laughs> Oh, okay, let me see. We're getting recorded, okay. But the director of Gyan will not hope he won't. Okay. So here is my tree, right? Right? And on the top of this tree, okay, so there is a, okay. So on this top of tree, there's a little bird sitting. Okay, so whatever. So here is my bat, right? So he's sending out the signal. He's sending out the signal, and he knows there's a bird there, right? He hits the object, and it returns to him. He picks it up again. And he's got a big smile on his face now. Aha. Uh -huh. So he knows the distance, right? x is equal to velocity. What is it? v is equal to x divided by t. Right? So he knows exactly where the bird is. So he'll, he'll come and get it. So yeah, he will emit an ultrasound, which is very fast, extremely fast. So, okay. No, I was serious when I do that, okay? I was not joking, I mean, that was a, although my drawing looked like it was a little cartoonish, but. So here also what we're doing is, <clears throat> this, acoustic transducer is emitting longitudinal wave
They're capable of emitting longitudinal and shear waves. Right? Oh, sorry. Yeah. So they're, they're capable of doing this. Okay? Sometimes you want to use a shear wave. Okay? So if I uh, have water here, for instance, okay, some medium, because many times ultrasonic testing is done in water, actually. If you go to the NDE labs, they've got a big tank, like a sw swimming pool, not very big, maybe as big as this table from here to there, you know, from there and about this high. Huh? And they've got water in there. <clears throat> so when you have a, a steel or a forging comes over, you put that forging inside that water, okay? You put that forging inside the water, and you put your transducer, you know, and it emits this, right? <clears throat> it emits these things. When it hits the interface of this water, the signals obviously will go, and it will split up into, actually, yeah, okay. Um, yeah. I don't know the exact figure, but I'm going to put something like that. I just want to make a point that <clears throat> it splits up into longitudinal and shear. Okay? So now you can change this angle, basically, the, this transducer angle, theta. You can keep changing it till you reach a critical angle so that um, <clears throat> the longitudinal wave will come out of the medium and you're left only with the shear wave. So you're, you're basically, because these two waves are moving together, right? Uh, one will be faster than the other. Maybe the longitudinal is faster than the shear. So the, so the longitudinal wave will come back outside, out into the medium, and the shear wave, maybe not so, you know, like, and you got the shear wave here. Only shear wave. And there is your, uh, let's say, piece of uh, forging. A forging. We got a forging from Bharat, guys. Right? And here is some defect, a little defect, okay? Not very big. Some. They do a good job, so not very big defects. So then you can, you know, detect it, right? But of course, uh, you can't just detect it in one time. You have to do the whole scanning, completely scan, right? So, so that's the... So this is the first critical angle. This is the first critical angle where you only have shear wave left and you're operating everything with a shear wave, right? <coughs> but now as you keep changing the orientation of this, you will get to the second critical angle. Where now you will have the guided waves. So this wave now will be moving along the surface. So when this second critical angle, incident, incident angle, I'm not doing a good job of writing, so let me repeat this. God, this is awful. OK. So here is my transducer. So, on, off, okay. So here is my transducer, okay? And the energy is coming out of the transducer, and it splits up into two waves, <clears throat> the longitudinal wave and the shear wave, okay? And each one of them has their own velocity. They're not the same. So if I want to use the shear wave as it is more sensitive to the damage, I want to just use this, so I will kind of let this come out of the medium totally. When this happens, obviously I'm tilting this transducer so that this guy comes out. That is your first critical angle where you only have the shear wave. And sometimes what we will do, if this happens to be, just let us take an example. This happens to be 30 degrees, just for the heck of it. I will build a, a little, uh, I will build a, a wooden block, maybe. Wooden block, so that's my transducer there, right? So, uh, there. So I'll put an angle like this to the horizontal. This is going to be tricky. Uh, okay, so I want my transducer there, so I want a, I want a, 
something like that. So I will fix this transducer in this wedge, in this, in this wooden wedge, so I don't have to move this around all the time. I'll make a hole and the transducer will fit exactly once I determine what the critical angle is to the horizontal and I'll build a, a triangular wedge and I'll put my transducer inside there, okay? So that, so that when I get that critical angle, theta sub c, I only have this shear component to use for my inspection, okay? So now what we, what we said was if I keep on incl inclining this more and more, this ultimately the shear wave will start to propagate along this boundary. That is the wave that I want as a guided wave. A guided wave is one which is traveling on the surface. Huh? Huh? Surface wave. Hmm? Oh, you're talking about L-O-W-E, low waves and Rayleigh waves, yes, yeah. There are lamb waves too, the lamb waves also. Is it the same wave? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But there's a lot of mechanics associated with it. A lot of mechanics, right? It's all theory of elasticity, unfortunately. It's all elasticity, theory of elasticity. That's why I can't go into it without preparing. I mean, it's very difficult, actually. <coughs> Jan Achenbach. That's the guy I was, the names I was thinking of. <coughs> he wrote a book on this whole thing. He's a professor at Northwest University. Okay. So... So when, you, when you're doing this pipeline inspection, where we said that the, <clears throat> so there is my, And my fl fluids are traveling, like, uh, actually, there's no, it's opening there, actually. Um, there's a well line. <clears throat> you know, it just keeps going. So, if there is a damage in this pipe, it will usually be <clears throat> in this thickness. In this thickness. Okay, so, <clears throat> that's the time I'm using this guided wave. So, it will, and, uh, I would think, this is my guess, I would think that the damage would be on the outer surface rather than the inside. Well, it could be inside. Yeah, outside is it will be easier. Okay? If it's inside, depending on what the thickness is, we, we may have to adjust the transducer. I'm, I didn't do it practically. But like I said, a lot of the industry is using this pipeline inspection routinely. So they use guided waves for pipeline inspection, okay? So I'm just telling you very, you know, some of the things that are being done at a very top level. Pipeline inspection. Using, there are a lot of pipelines, sir, Anupji, Anupji, huh? Yeah, using. Huh? Yeah. Right. Yeah, they're checking? Okay. Okay. Yeah. So here you have symmetrical. It's been, yeah, I can't, it's been a while since I've done any of this stuff. It's anti symmetrical. Lamb waves. And each one has their own characteristics and you want to use one of them, you know. So that's all what I know about uh, 
the guided wave sensors, you know, but they're using it quite routinely. Uh, Yeah. Yes. So how, how you, you do some assessment? You have explained it. Uh, right. What made. Yeah. But what, what is, how the assessment is? You can only get qualitative, for instance. All I'm saying is you can detect the damage. Okay. But quantitative, you have to do more analysis, obviously. I don't know exactly how to do that right now. Yeah. So we are talking at a very qualitative level, right? Uh, I mean, there are equations available. I mean, don't mistake me, there are equations available to do the quantitative stuff. The third thing I want to explain is the, um, I don't even know what it's called anymore. Uh, it's a, so we took a tensile sample, Satish. So this is a fatigue sample. Fatigue sample. So this paper is Satish, S-A-T-H. He writes his name differently. S-A-T-H-I-S-H. Satish and, yeah, Satish et al. Okay? So what we did here is to, there is something called as a uh, ultrasonic uh, horn. Ultrasonic horn. That will be, so we are, we are fatiguing it. So there is damage is being created inside it. The damage is initially, the damage is initially dislocations. <clears throat> A lot of dislocations are being generated and they're forming these networks, dislocation networks, and then eventually a crack will appear. crack will appear. Okay. So you are hitting, so there are dislocation networks here. Hmm? So you're hitting ultrasonic energy into this, not with a transducer, but with an ultrasonic horn. It's emitting very powerful waves. And here it's not touching the sample. So a lot of it is going in air actually. So you're going to lose some, some of it, maybe 25% is gone. So you're only using three quarters of the energy, okay? And uh, I can look up the details actually, it's there. Um, our goal was to uh, pick, up the, uh, pick up the precursor damage. Precursor, is that right? Is that right? Yeah. Precursor damage. Because before the crack forms, is a dislocation networks are forming, and also the temperature of the sample is rising. Temperature of the sample is rising. So we had a very sensitive uh, thermal, I'm struggling for, uh, so t delta T. I want to just put a very general word, use a thermal sensor. It has to be very, very, uh, it has to be very, very sensitive. So some of these thermal, the pick up the thermal energy. Have you ever seen when you go into a jungle, if you're, if you're in a jungle, if I'm in a jungle, you can wear those goggles, right? The therm, uh, infrared goggles, and my body is emitting infrared radiation, I can tell that I'm, somebody can tell I'm there, you know? Some animal is there because the body of the animal's, temp the body's temperature is different than the surrounding temperature. So you're not using the same principle, but kind of, kind of. This sample is getting warm, okay? So this is, this therm thermal sensor is uh, almost 10 to the minus five degrees Kelvin sensitive resolution. Very, very high resolution, okay? So you can pick up whatever thermal changes are taking place, okay? And there are equations for that. It's a much simpler equation, actually. Then you plot 
uh, number of cycles, fatigue cycles, to the delta T. And you can determine the damage. Again, if you want to quantify it, you have to do a lot of work. You have to plot this, okay, plot this, cut it up, take the, uh, take the sample to the electron microscope, and look at the uh, dislocation density. You can measure the dislocation density and correlate the dislocation density with the rise in temperature, another plot, and be able to tell how the damage is evolving, essentially. Okay? You can tell how the damage is evolving. See, if you don't use something, you forget it. You know? Uh, page two, page one. So that's another, the third one. Page four. Let's go to the acoustic emission technique because it falls under non destructive testing. Non destructive testing, yes, it does. Um, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> I'm going to tell you the work that I did. I'm familiar with it, little, just like this, but my familiarity is kind of fading a little bit. It's become more common technique. I never thought that it would become common. Well, again, it depends on what industry. You, are. you, you cannot use this for our industry, for the aer aircraft industry, because there's so much noise Right? There's so much noise, you cannot differentiate between this noise. Okay, you'll see that in a second, what I'm talking about. So, this is my tensile sample, and I'm pulling it in the Instron machine or a servo hydraulic machine. Basically, I'm doing a tensile test. I'm doing a tensile test on an Inconel 718 specimen. Okay? And I know microstructurally, this Inconel 17 has two sets of particles. Large particles, small particles. Right? So this is what I'm doing on this test. And I'm putting on top of this an acoustic emission transducer. Acoustic emission transducer or receiver, either one. We call it the acoustic emission transducer, but In reality, it's working as a receiver, but they call it as acoustic emission transducer. So you, you put this on top of that, and you, uh, so, so we used uh, electrical tape. If you're trying to use, are you going to use this? Acoustic emission technique? No? Okay. So I thought maybe you're trying to use it. So you can, you can put this uh, thing on top of the tensile sample. You have to, otherwise the energy is lost. And you can put a tape, electrical black tape, electrical tape, so that it stays in one place. So you can see. Uh, <clears throat> so I just put it away from here, but it goes on top of that. So the receiver goes, is glued to the, to the tensile sample. Okay? So now I have uh, two data acquisition, data acquisition, one data acquisition two. So these guys are acquiring the data. This guy's acquiring load and stress strain, okay, load and load and elongation. And this guy is acquiring the number of acoustic emission signal, amp not the number, but the amplitude, and number two actually. Uh, acoustic emission signal amplitude. Because this has got a piezoelectric crystal, right? A piezoelectric crystal, what it does is, piezoelectric crystal, 
what it does? Exactly. So when the sound is produced, this particle is cracked, right? It will produce a sound, and this guy will pick it up. The transducer will pick it up, and it will convert to the electrical signal, okay? So what I said is, what happens is when you're doing this, initially it's quiet, it's quiet, but when the dislocations are coming out, there will be an action, uh, there, okay, so here's, I'm sorry. This is, my, this is my stress strain curve. So up until here, on this acoustic emission signal, it's very quiet. Nothing is happening. Elastic, elastic limit. And then the dislocations are coming out here. Here's the yield point. So the dislocations are being emitted. So just about there, you'll see some signals. Some amplitude, some signals, because of this dislocation activity. And then when you go up in strain, let us say this is epsilon one. So that is my epsilon one. Here is my epsilon two. Epsilon two. Where my first particles are cracking, the large ones are cracking, right? You remember I showed you a graph where large particles crack first, second particles. So I have a distribution of these guys, right? This guy is just not one size. There are, there's a distribution of size, right? So this will be like number of particles versus size. Hmm? It's a Gaussian distribution, normal distribution, where the mean is right there. There is my standard deviation, one, one standard deviation, one sigma, one sigma on either side, right? So if this is 100, let's say my size 100 microns. Let us say this is 100 microns, my mean, the standard deviation would be maybe plus minus 10, 90 and 110, something like that, in that range, 90 and 110 microns range. So they'll start to, so at this epsilon two, actually, We had a very good distribution, actually, of these acoustic emission signals. <coughs> very nice. And then, as you keep doing, the small particles will start to crack. They need higher stress, epsilon dot three. And you get another peak. Ta-da, I mean. <laughs> I mean, that's a very good one-to-one -one relationship you see in this material. I have the data if you want, I can show you. From the paper, long time ago. Okay, uh, so that's, but now today they use it for pressure vessels. You can use it for stress corrosion cracks, acoustic emission. So when we were talking about fracture toughness of a material, and we said, the girl is not here today? She's not here, no, I don't see her. So when the load drops like this, that means the crack has propagated. The crack has just moved. This transducer will pick it up big time. You will see a big burst. And you know, that's the crack length at that time. That's the, that's the crack length you can use, you know. So, so today they're using it routinely for uh, stress corrosion cracking. So when they're doing uh, pressure, uh, pressure vessel testing, pressure vessel proof tests, you can put the transducer and, and see when it's going to crack in a real pressure vessel. And you can also do that, you know, uh, in my glory days when I was in Germany, uh, they were testing this uh, Airbus wing, right, in uh, Berlin, and uh, I mean D uh, Dresden. <clears throat> they were testing the wing, right? So at that time they had, it was a static test to see how far the wing can go on a 380. 
you know, because they wanted to see both the deflection, how much it can take. So the, so the pulley was pulling little by little by little. And at that time, you can have these acoustic emission sensors put everywhere, right? And as soon as it starts to, it'll pick it up. You know, it'll pick it up. So it is a sensor that's being used routinely for some things. But if you put this in a moving airplane, you can't. Because this guy, this guy has got a certain range where it is sensitive. This transducer has got a certain frequency range where it is sensitive. And if your sound that's coming from the airplane, engine noise, you know, other noises in the airplane, if they overlap with the frequency range of this transducer, I mean, not the frequency range, um, the crack. If there's a crack that's forming, the noise that's coming from the crack or, or precursor to the crack, like there's noise from the engine, noise from just the whole movement of the airplane, little, little bit, you know, it's like, it's like climbing on the ladder. You know how it is, the wooden ladder when you climb, crr, crr, it'll make those little noises, right? Same thing. So that's, that's, there are some issues. I mean, this is a very mature technology, very mature. They're using it routinely, but we can, I mean, the aircraft industry cannot use it. It doesn't work, unless you're doing a static test very carefully in the lab, you know, with the 380 bus, Airbus type of a test, you know, wing being pulled, yeah. You can do that. So, let me see. We are breaking at one, Amit, or 1.30? Okay, <clears throat> one. Um, let me talk about microstructure and modeling, and then we, you know, again, very little bit I can tell you. Not very much at all. Not very much at all. Pardon me, excuse me, Shinde. Huh? Yes, they're same in a way, yes. They're just different range. In ultrasonics, you can send signals of very large range, right? All the way from kilohertz, megahertz, you know, um, some of the transducers. Uh, the rule of thumb is, the rule of thumb is, Higher the frequency, let me write it down here. So we'll have it record in the. Higher the frequency is same as smaller, wave, smaller the wavelength. So you can, with higher the frequency, smaller the wavelength, you can resolve <coughs> smaller de defects. So if I have a defect that's one micron, or maybe, yeah, then you can accordingly pick your ultrasonic Transducer. Again, like I said, when you say transducer, it's also receiver. Um, so whenever you go to the NDT laboratory, when you open the drawer, you see a whole bunch of transducers sitting there in a wooden box, all different different frequencies. You know, so people will start something like a lower frequency to get a scan of the damage. You may not be able to resolve exactly, but you'll be able to tell there is a damage, and then you kind of go and pick higher and higher frequencies till you're you are completely, you know, you're bounding the problem essentially. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but in the case of the acoustic transducer, I think the range is, they're also available in different ranges. Uh, but, but in the acoustic emission transducers, you're picking the energy. You're, you are receiving the energy most of the time. You're not sending any energy. You're picking the energy from either a crack or a particle cracking some of those kind of things. But in the case of ultrasonics, you're sending a wave, ultrasonic wave, and receiving it back from the defect. So if there's a well defect, for instance, you can put it, in, put it in the water tank. The only reason I'm putting it in the water tank is because the loss of energy is very minimal as compared to air. In the air, I may lose 50% of the energy. 
So instead of doing the ultrasonic testing in air, I'd rather put it in a water tank because when my ultrasonic waves are passing through water, no problem, nothing is going to be lost. So that's why you have a water tank when we go to the NDT labs. You know. Yes. Absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. Now the modern technology is, I'm just showing you the principle, the concept, physics concept, but the modern technology is much different. You can get an array of transducers. So I may have transducers one, two, three, four, five, six, and each one of them, each one of them will fire one after the other, different, different frequencies, and it'll be able to scan the whole like this, like a beam almost. This guy will do, do the scanning. The second guy, second guy will fire at a different frequency. The third guy will fire. So they sell these patches now, ultrasonic, you know, transducer patches with different frequencies. You can do the whole scan. The technology is so damn advanced. It's not even funny. Unbelievable. It's tough to keep up what's, with what's going on out there. You know, these guys are just making constantly something new. And uh, so, uh, You can. Uh, well, the, the thing you have to know, you, that's where I was just coming come there. You cannot do certain things because this is, a, this is a very important topic actually right now in the NDE world, is for the microstructural community. You were talking about microstructure modeling. <clears throat> so there are, there are a lot of NDE guys right now. I'm trying to see. So microstructural modeling right now is, like you guys are into forging business. Big work is going on all over the world right now in the forging area where they want to put all the processing parameters. You don't have to tell us all your processing parameters. I know it's probably, but there are a lot of processing parameters, right? You know, temperature, workpiece, you know, workpiece thickness, workpiece dimensions, you know. dimensions. And uh, loads, how much loads, and how many number of hits, right? What do you call that? Loads. Yeah. How, yeah, number of, uh, <clears throat> <clears throat> you know. In the case of rolling, number of, each time you take a bite, put it back in, you know. So you don't forge one from here to there and one, no, obviously not. I didn't, I didn't catch the word exactly that you said. Blows. Blows. B-L-O-W-S. There are certain frequencies that I can't hear. Uh, number of blows. Okay. <clears throat> um, so these are loads. Strain rates. Yeah. So then all, all, these, all, these, all these variables are there. And now on the right side, uh, I don't know how far you go, but you probably want to look at the the processing map, maybe, whether the structure is cracked or not cracked, are you getting recrystallization, are you not getting recrystallization, all those parameters, right? Uh, what would you call that? Is it microstructural parameters or is it uh, something before that? So these are process parameters. Uh, this would be, can we call microstructure parameters? No, it's not microstructure yet. Because they're at the top level, right? The, you know, they're at the top level. The grain has, grain size is not yet defined. It's not completely defined yet because you haven't gotten to the solution heat treatment yet. Huh? Macro, macro structure. Perfect, great, yeah. <clears throat> macro structure. So all the, uh, you know, and then you probably can do the solution heat treatments and other things. But I think as far as, so in your case, for instance, people are dying to get this, this database. They will pay you money for, because no industry wants to give you free database, no way. You pay us the money, we'll give you the database, right? Or we haven't generated yet, because you don't want to make enemies with anybody. You'll say, well, we haven't done that yet. 
So why don't you give me your nickel-based super alloy, little, and we will give you whatever parameters you want. And people want this because right now, the big data is the name, is the game in the, in the town. This is the game that everybody is playing in town right now, right? Because everybody wants data so that you can, they're calling it as big data, right? What are books and books on big data right now? You know, uh, how to put this data so that the computer can understand. Digital, uh, transforming the data into digital information. How do you do that, right? Machine language and all this stuff, you know. Uh, so, and the same thing that is happening at the microstructure, this is macro. At the microstructure, yes, we are. Oh, my modeling friends will think Kumar is crazy the way he's talking. Because they're all hardcore modeling guys. Excuse me, guys. <laughs> I'm not a modeling guy, but I'm just putting whatever I know here. Um, <clears throat> Recrystallization, or grain size. So you got all this uh, heat treatment thing here on the, well, actually it's on this side, heat treatment, and then, you know, grain size, second phase particles, and on and on, you know, you know all those things, you know, texture, you know. The thing is, how do you, how do you, so if I, if I have a, on the scanning electron microscope, I'm going to get my information, right? I'm getting some information, you know. I'm getting some information like this. But how do I digitize this and store it as numbers in the computer? That's the biggest thing. You know, so my knowledge as far as, I'm not a computer scientist for a second, right? I'm not a computer scientist. You give me a picture, you know, we can go to the electron microscope and we can give you this picture, but after that the computer guy has to come and develop a program to change all this to dig digitize every information that he has or she has here into this digital information. It has to be done for this, it has to be done for the grain size, it has to be done for particles, texture, on and on it goes on. Recrystallization, everything. So it's a huge, huge, huge thing. So everybody's trying to connect the dots a little bit, like you guys are processing guys. I mean, this is not a, on mechanical properties, we, we're not even talking about that. That's a totally different game. Even here, in your case, when you're doing this uh, modeling, process modeling, process modeling, um, let us say you're doing process modeling on aluminum lithium alloys, right? Aluminum, take a fifth, now, right now, I didn't want to say that yesterday, but right now we are in the fifth generation aluminum lithium alloys actually, not third generation, fifth generation. I got the book with me actually. And uh, so if we, if we give you a fifth generation aluminum lithium alloy and we say, hey guys, do you think it's possible to forge this material, right? So then you will say, well, let's try, right? So, and if it's successful, then you put all this, even if it's not successful, but you have all these processing parameters and all these macro structures like you talked about, they all have to be captured, digitized, you know. And I'm trying to see the machine language. Uh, that's also a very important tool. I'm not able to recall everything right now. Uh, it's on my phone, you know. Um, Yeah. Right, right. Absolutely. They have this software based on micro model only, and uh, they evaluate uh, properties at each node point based on the distribution of reinforcement and the constituents. Right. So for, I can almost tell what these guys are up to right now because I know what these guys they want to know uh, location proper location dependent properties, right? 
if you give a component, where if I, if I have a bigger component like this, they would like to know at any given point what is the property, what are the mechanical properties there in that little boundary. You know, what, are the, what is the fatigue, what is the creep, what are the residual stresses, can you model all these things? So every, every person in this world right now is on, uh, is on this thing. Big data, a revolution that will, you know, okay. So big data, a revolution that will transform how we live and how we think. You know, so, sorry. Um, I'm trying to see. Okay. Um, I thought I had this. So anyways, there are, you know, a lot of these books are, you know, they're available right now, automation, I mean, not automation, but uh, machine language. People are trying to learn a little bit, at least a little bit. You know, you, you can't become a machine language guy next, you know, you have taken so many years to become a forging guy. It's so difficult to become, you know, something else right now. I'm, I'm having a tough time to do, big, to do other things, you know, so I have to depend on, People here, for instance, who's a computer scientist or somebody, can you model this for me? Or uh, where is Amit? Oh, there he is. Yeah, he's a modeling guy. He's a modeling guy too. He and Pankaj, they're all modeling guys. If you tell them, hey, can you model this for us? I'm going to come back to him next year, you know, to model some of these things, right? Uh, I don't want to do it, but I have to know a little bit at least to speak intelligently. You know, otherwise he doesn't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, so. So if you're going to go to the bookstore, I'll go with you, Indian bookstore, between now and tomorrow. Uh, I would like to go actually see what's going on here. Uh, so let me think, just give me a second here. Um, at the end of the day, what everybody's trying to do is this, uh, that engineering models, that's what they're interested in. They're not interested in scientific models. No. Can I give an engineer a model which is simple? You know, nobody wants a complicated model where I have to scratch my brain and ask somebody else, you know? You want a model which is simple. Here are the forging parameters.